Well, hello everybody and welcome here back to the farm. And today we're out here breathing this beautiful fresh air. And I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Now, we're going to be looking at a subject in a minute, but before we do that, I want to remind you to check out the workshop guides, as you can see here, which I've been showing to you each week, but these are available to download free of charge on the link below. Also, don't forget the night photography shooting guides. Now these are really handy and you can put them into your camera bag, take them out with you, and you can refer to all of the different settings that we have in our photography as we work through this series. Now I really want to thank you for your amazing support of this series. It's been phenomenal. I mean so many people have sent me uh, emails and messages and so forth encouraging me to continue on and so I'm planning to do that. Um, and as well as that, I really appreciate just that those of you who have financially contributed to the project because without you, I wouldn't be able to do this, that's for sure. Today, we're going to be looking at time lapse and I want to show you some of the equipment and techniques I use to shoot them. But what exactly is time lapse and what's the difference between creating time lapse and shooting other forms of nightscape images? Well, in simple terms, time-lapse is a way of speeding up time. It's like compressing a lot of slow-moving action into a faster sequence. For example, you may shoot a time-lapse of uh, clouds moving across the sky, and this may take 30 minutes to actually happen. When you play back the time-lapse, it only takes about 10 seconds, and the flow of movement is really quite dynamic compared to the action in real time. So, in effect, time lapse is exactly the same as shooting single exposures. All we're doing is joining a whole sequence of those single shots together. So when we're talking about nightscape time lapse, then it's just the same in principle as daytime time lapse. We take a number of exposures to highlight the movement in the scene and we join them all together to make a short movie. Now there are lots of excellent videos available explaining time lapse here on YouTube and I'd advise you to do a search and see what you can learn. Today I'm only going to focus on shooting nightscape time lapse as well because that's what I do. <laughs> now because the time lapse is made up of a large number of single images, the most common question people ask is, well, how many images do you need to make a time lapse? Well, the answer to that is a bit like, well, how long is a piece of string? But there are some handy guidelines to follow. Now you may remember I talked about photography being all about mathematics way back in episode one. Well, here we go again. A time lapse is in effect a video clip. Video has what is known as a frame rate. This relates to how many single shots make up a video sequence. Now here in Australia, as well as Europe and the UK, we operate on the PAL television system. And that's a standard frame rate of 25 frames per second. Now what that means is that for every second of video, there are actually 25 single images. So if you do the calculation, to get 10 seconds of video, we need 250 single shots. That's 25 times 10. Now, I don't want to make this more complicated than what it already is, but you folks over in the United States use the NTSC television system, and some bright spark way back in the day decided that 30 frames per second sounded like a good idea. I really have no idea why the whole world can't have the same video standard, but anyway, that's just the way it is. I'm sure you've seen the various frame rates available in your camera video settings. Now, these days you'll generally find 24, 25, 30, 50 and 60 frames per second available. Now, a lot of people get carried away about 24 frames per second because that was always used to produce major feature films. But for time lapse, it's really quite irrelevant. And I always use 25 frames per second for all my time lapses. Before we move on, I need to mention the higher frame rates of 50 and 60. These are essentially double the standard frame rate, and they're really useful for shooting slow motion footage in video, as you can slow down the footage to half the speed, and you still get really smooth flowing footage. And that reminds me to mention that the more frames or single images you include in your time lapse, the smoother the final video will be. For example, if you shoot 250 frames and make the final video 10 seconds in length, 
that gives it a frame rate of 25 frames per second, as we mentioned earlier. But if we shoot, let's say 125 frames, so that's half as many images, and still make the video 10 seconds in length, then the frame rate will only be 12.5 frames per second. Now this has the effect of making the video appear choppy and nowhere near as smooth as the video with more frames. And I'm sure you've seen plenty of videos like that. Now, of course, there are lots of other variables that come into it, such as the interval between the individual shots, etc. but we'll get onto that later. So in summary, a time-lapse is a collection of individual frames grouped together to create a video. It's as simple as that. When shooting daytime time-lapse, we have to be fairly careful about the settings and intervals, etc. But when shooting night time-lapses to show the movement of the stars, we have a lot more flexibility because the movement is actually so slow. My typical settings for my time-lapses go something like this. If I'm shooting on a wide-angle lens of about 14 millimeters or thereabouts, then I'll shoot 15 second exposures with a five second interval for about two and a half to three hours. Now this will give me about 400 single images, which translates into a 16 second video clip. So that's 400 divided by 25. To be honest, you don't need to know all the maths. All you need to do is remember the basic settings and how to connect it all up. Right now, I'm gonna run you through some of the gear I use to shoot certain time-lapse clips, and I'll talk you through my setup for each one. So come on, let's go and have a look. Okay, well our first example is here. Now, this is no surprise to you guys. You've seen this old hay shed many times in previous videos. But the reason I brought you here now is because I wanted to explain the setup that I use. This was a time lapse I set up a couple of years ago now, and I was pretty happy with how that one went. Now, I used my Nikon D750, which is here now, with the Nikon 14 to 24F 2.8 lens. I had it set to 14 millimeters because I wanted the widest possible field of view. Now that brings me to one important point, talking about time lapses. Now, when you're shooting time lapses, television standard, by the way, is a native 16 by nine aspect ratio. Now most cameras, these cameras included, shoot at a native three by two aspect ratio, which is squarer. So in other words, to get that to play on my TV, I've got to crop the top, and the bottom or, or one or the other or sometimes both uh, to get it to fit so in other words what i'm going to do is pretty much overshoot a little bit in a vertical plane so that i can crop it down to a 16 by 9 aspect ratio so it, pl it plays properly on my television or my computer screen whichever it may be now as far as taking the shots it was pretty much standard as to what I would be shooting if I was just shooting single exposures as I mentioned before. So for this one I took 500 images with a total exposure time of 20 seconds. Now that was 15 second shutter speed with a five second interval. Now a lot of people ask about the interval. How do you work out the interval? Now for slow moving objects, for example the Milky Way is very slow, clouds at night especially, quite slow. The interval can be longer and you still won't get that stuttering. Of course you can shoot closer in one, two or three second intervals. But if you do that, you're gonna have a whole lot more frames to deal with, which is not a problem except for processing. It just takes a lot longer because you're taking more frames in the same amount of time. So I took 500 uh, and I was wrapped. Now I had a little bit of moonlight, just a crescent moon. And you'll see in the video in a minute where the moon, you can see it's sort of setting down. I also put a low level light down inside the hay shed. At the time there was a little bit more hay in there, so it was backlit so that you could see the inside there, just on a really low level, which I always do for time lapse. And um, I was wrapped in that. I used, by the way, an intervalometer. Now the intervalometer is what I tend to use most of the time when I'm shooting with these cameras rather than use the inbuilt uh, timer. And I set this up because they're so easy to use. You can make them uh, all the intervals and the shutter speed and everything else, piece of cake, you just let it go. It's the same as what I use when I'm doing star trails. Now one other thing that I remember using here, it was in July when I took this, pretty cold, so, and this is something I'm guilty of a lot, is that my lens fogs up. <laughs> when it's cold weather, you know, you go away and you're doing 500 frames and you come back and, and about the last 200 are all fogged over. It's happened to me plenty of times. So in this case, I had a lens warmer on there with a battery pack under here, good as gold, 500 frames, cold weather, no worries at all. And I'm pretty happy with how that one came out.
Now this is where things get a whole lot more interesting because what I like to do often is put a little bit of movement into the camera to increase the dynamics of the shot. So in this particular example I'm going to show you, I use this slider. Now this is one of the cheapest sliders that you could buy and I don't even know if you can buy them anymore because I bought it off a guy in Melbourne locally here in Australia, he handmade them. Um, and it's just battery operated and it just slides across from one side to the other very slowly. It's not a move, shoot, move or anything like that. It just keeps continually going at a very slow pace. But I'm gonna show you how I set that up. So here we have the subject for my second example of time-lapse. Now, I was using the slider, but I wanted something in the foreground because when you're using a slider or any sort of movement with your time-lapse camera, then whatever is close to the camera gives the impression of a lot more movement than something that's off in the distance. In fact, if I just had this set up here, looking off into the sky down there on the paddock or whatever, you would hardly notice any, any movement at all. So it's important to put something in the foreground. And as you know, I love putting subjects and beautiful old cars and things like this in the foreground. So what I did, I set my camera up back there. I was again using the Nikon 14 to 24 and the D750. And I'll just run you through the exact setup for that. Okay, so here you can see the setup. Now, I've got the D750 here, which is quite, with this lens, it's quite a heavy combination. So I put a ball head on top of this slider and all it does is set it to its slowest setting and it takes about two and a half hours to go from one side all across to the other. Now, I had my intervalometer hooked up so that this was controlling the camera. So it was the same settings exactly as before. Now, I took 325 images uh, for a total of, I think it was about 13 seconds of final video. Um, so you can work out the maths on that. But I've got these two little tripods here, which gives me the ability to level this slider. So it's not going up or down here. It's going as straight as I can possibly get it. Now, the landscape around here is not straight, so it doesn't really matter. The horizon, you can't even see the horizon properly. And if you could, it's not straight. But I had the Milky Way core coming down in that western sky over there beautifully over the top of the Austin here. And I love that little bit of movement just creates that dynamics. Now, I had to light the Austin because otherwise it would have just been a dark silhouette in the foreground. And I don't like dark silhouettes. So I used a low level light, a Z96 over there on a small little light stand. I'll just show you that how I set it up. So here I have a Z96 video light on a tiny little tripod. Doesn't matter what you put it on as long as you can get it on the right angle. I put it here with the orange gel on the front and you can see it there. Now, I had this on a really low level. Now this is known as low level lighting. I've talked about it quite a bit before, but I've got to, you've got to realize that um, this light is, has to be on for the full duration of my shots over there. So if that takes two and a half hours to shoot, this has to be on for two and a half hours. So I need a light source that is reliable over that length of time. So what I did, I put it here, which is about a 90 degree angle to where the camera is over there, shining on the side of the Austin. And the camera is actually at the back. So it was getting a sort of a three quarter rear view of the car with the Milky Way over there in the sky. I just love this shot. And I just love the dynamics. I've done quite a few time lapses, which I'll show you here using this exact same method where I've got that slider over there with a Z96 as a low level light. And I reckon they look great. Now, one of the more specialized uses of time-lapse is to capture one that starts in the daytime and finishes in the nighttime. Now, this is a day-to-night time-lapse, or you can do a night-to-day. Now, to do that obviously means you have to change the settings on the camera dramatically between the nighttime shots 
and the daytime shots. Now I've taken a little bit of time out to come to this location because I did that very thing here, down there where those trees are in the background, uh, about a year and a half ago, this particular shot. Now I've done this quite a few times in other locations, but I just wanted to show you the device I use to make that happen. Now this is an intervalometer known as a time-lapse plus view. Now I've showed you this on a couple of other videos, which I'll link here, but essentially what this does is automates the process of shooting day to night time-lapse. So on this particular occasion here, I shot this beginning in the daytime, I was shooting one two thousandths of a second shutter speed at eight second intervals. So you'll see on the time lapse there's quite a lot of daytime shots because they're quickly spaced apart, one two thousandths of a second. And what happened, that ramped down as the sky darkened and the Milky Way came out, I eventually got to 20 seconds with a five second interval between each shot. I shot this on the Nikon D750 with the 14 to 24 f 2.8. Got the Milky Way core coming down behind those trees in the western horizon. So the way it works is that we begin our exposures in the daytime at ISO 100 at the whatever shutter speed is necessary to get a good exposure. So you do that manually, you set it up manually as it is, just like you would with any other photograph. Then you set the parameters inside the device to give it uh, the maximum ISO that you want to go to and the maximum shutter speed and all of those things. So those are all preset. And then what you do, you just start it off and let it go. And the camera actually, uh, or this device uses the camera exposure meter to calculate the light level. So it adjusts the, the ISO and the shutter speed. Now I set it to keep the aperture at f2.8 all the way through. And the reason I do that is because when you start changing aperture, you tend to introduce a lot more flicker, which is not something that I like. Uh, it's harder to deal with. And I was pretty happy anyway, because I could set the aperture at f2.8 and still get a decent daytime exposure uh, by changing the other parameters. So that wasn't the problem. But yeah, this is a great device. And this is made by a guy in the United States. You can look it up on the webpage listed here. Uh, works really well. Uh, it does take a little bit of time to get used to its little idiosyncrasies and setting it up, but once you get it working, it just operates and co connects via USB, it's a really, really good device. Now, as you can imagine, the editing of images in this type of sequence takes a little bit more time, but there's a fantastic plugin which is designed by the same people who made this intervalometer called Time Lapse Plus Studio, which is absolutely fantastic. It's a plugin to Lightroom, so you can do all of the editing within Lightroom itself, and that saves an awful lot of time. Now, a lot of cameras have internal time lapse mode built in. And they actually work quite well. Often they'll render it out as a movie in camera, which makes the process really quick and easy. Now, this is fine unless you prefer to do some editing to your final product. Some people will suggest using auto modes to shoot time lapse in camera, and I guess there are places where that can work quite well, especially aperture priority mode. But like everything else related to nightscape shooting, I strongly suggest shooting in full manual mode to get the best results. I mean, things like auto white balance are a no-no in my opinion, because you don't want color changes throughout your sequence. And also if you enable auto ISO, you can really quickly get lots of exposure changes, which manifest as flickering through the sequence. Oh wow, well, you can see I'm back on the farm, there's mosquitoes all over the place at the moment. Anyway, so as you can see from what I've said, there are lots of things to consider before shooting a time lapse. So I think the best thing we can do is go and actually shoot one and see what results we can get. Now, I'm not too sure if we'll be getting much cloud cover tonight. Um, I actually like having some cloud in my time lapse sequences. It, it adds another dimension of movement across the frame, which I really like. A time lapse is all about movement, and the more movement we can capture, the more dynamic a final, final video will be. Okay. Let's go looking for a good location to shoot our time lapse and we'll just see what we can find. Okay, well I've been hunting for a location to shoot our time lapse tonight and I've decided on this spot down here by the creek. There's a fair bit of water and I like it. Face, there's a big gap over there facing towards where the Milky Way core is going to rise up. So I've got my time lapse slider back here. I'm just going to show you the setup because I'm going to do a slide and I'm using 
different equipment for this one to any of the examples I've showed you up to this point. So uh, yeah, I'll just run you through that right now. Okay, so this is a, a, well, it's a little bit of a precarious position I've got here, but anyway, I'll run you through what I'm doing here. So what I have here is an Edelkrone system. Now, to be honest with you, I have a love-hate relationship with this slider. Um, I first really came into contact with it when uh, I watched Alan Wallace's video talking about Milky Way time lapse about a year ago. And uh, that was a fantastic video by Alan, and he recommended this piece of equipment. Uh, the actual hardware is awesome. It's really, really good. I'm not a big fan of the app and the software. I have to keep updating it all the time. Uh, often you'll be out on location somewhere and you have to download an update for the app and it just is a, a pain in the backside. But apart from that, it actually works pretty well. So the big feature of this slider is the fact that you set it onto a tripod in the center piece here and it extends further than the actual length of the rail. So you'll get about, I don't know, probably about maybe 30 inches of travel with this and the actual slider itself is only about 13 or 14 inches long. So that's pretty handy. It's good. So what I'm going to do here, um, I haven't got my camera on here at the moment because it's, I don't, don't want to leave it down here. I've got to make sure this is very steady before I get it going later. Um, it has a motorized unit here, which actually mounts here. So it mounts on there like that, and that drives the belt. And then you program the app, as I mentioned, to make it sh uh, move, shoot, move. So it's a proper move, shoot, move time-lapse device. It'll Chrome Slider Plus, I think it is, uh, version 2. So it's the latest version of their slider. And um, yet you need a pretty good rigid tripod. I've got it nice and low down to the ground. And the reason I've got it here, well, I've got the water in the foreground. I've got this tree here, just this dead tree. And over there, I've got a nice open sky. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use at least one of these Z96 lights. I might use more than uh, more than one because uh, I want to light that tree over there, but I want to sort of uplight it and backlight it. And I definitely want a little bit of light just kissing this tree. Not much. I just want to touch. And of course, that has to be on for the whole duration of my time lapse, which I don't know. I'll, I'll probably set it to go for about three hours, I reckon. That should give me a nice amount of Milky Way coming up. Now, at the moment, we've got... It's looking like a fantastic night coming. There is a little bit of cloud cover. And as I mentioned to you earlier, I like clouds for time lapse. Not full cover, of course, but just a little bit because that gives you that extra dynamic. So at the moment, it's about five o'clock. Nowhere near dark yet, but it's not too far away. So I'm going to set this up and um, I'll get it working a bit later on. But I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll shoot the time lapse and get it all done. And then after I've done that, I'll run you through the settings I used and show you everything in operation because it's going to be a bit easier to do once the pressure of actually taking the time lapse is done and dusted. That's assuming it works. <laughs> uh, you never know. I might have to download some new uh, app or something. But anyway, I'm pretty happy. Gee, those mosquitoes, they're everywhere down here. It's the trouble with working around water. Man, oh man. Anyway, I'll go and set the lights up and then I might go and get something to eat. We'll come back and have a look at this. Now, it's getting quite dark, but I did want to run you through this other example of a time lapse using this gorgeous little old trike. Now, I've shot this trike a few times before, but I did time lapse one night and I put my 35mm f1.4 Sigma Art series lens on the D750 and I opened that right open to f1.4. Got the camera oh, only about 2 metres to basically fill the frame with the trike and focused on the trike. And my intention there was to throw the stars in the background out of focus and create that sort of bokeh artistic look. And it's not very commonly done with time lapse. And I absolutely loved that. Now I just had a fixed tripod position. I had my camera really low down to the ground. So, so low because I didn't want the horizon to interfere with the subject here in the foreground. And it looks absolutely fantastic. I actually ended up taking 800 shots. Now that's an awful long time. It goes for about 32 seconds. And I remember my settings, I had 10 second shutter speed. ISO 2500 with a three second interval between. Now the reason I, I speeded those things up a little bit was just because of the focal length. It's a 35mm lens. It's a little bit longer 
than the wide angles I was using for the other shots. But I love this shot. It absolutely still blows me away because those stars just look so, they look like jewels in the sky just because of that out of focus and the aeroplanes that coming through. And then you can see the clouds just rolling and billowing. Absolutely love this one. So I guess what I'm trying to say to you guys is don't limit your creativity just because you're doing a time lapse or a star trail or whatever it is. The creativity still has to be paramount and uppermost in our minds when we're creating these scenes. And you know, this is just a simple little tricycle sitting over there in the garden doing nothing really. So it's just a matter of making use of the tools and the things that you've got on hand. And what an absolutely gorgeous night it is out here. And I'm so happy to be out here. I'm looking for something else that I might shoot another time lapse tonight as well, whilst that one's going off down there. Not quite dark yet, so I've got a little bit of time just to have a look around and just see what we can create. So let's get going. Okay, now before I set up the slider time lapse over there, I had a second composition happening right here. So here is my second D750. This has got the Nikon 20mm f1.8 lens. And I've framed up on this tree, which I think you can, might, might be just be able to see in the background down there, the Milky Way core coming up over the top. And I've just come back to have a look at this and there's 700 frames. So it's been going for quite a long time and they look absolutely fantastic. I'll just show you those on the back of the screen so you can get a bit of a squeeze. Fantastic. Yep, so the settings I had here was f2.8 aperture, 15 second shutter speed, ISO 3200, white balance of, uh, where is it, 4550 Kelvin. So I've warmed it up a bit, but I love that orange glow in the background. And you can see there the Milky Way core just coming up above the tree. You'll see more of it a little bit later. I'll just go to the end of the time lapse and you'll see it there. There it is. Look at that. That is awesome. Now, I want to show you my lighting because there's some low level lighting here. You can see it on the back of the screen. I'll go and show you how I set that up. So as you can see, I've got the tree lit from the side. And if you pan over here, hopefully, we'll be able to see this light. There it is. It's a Z96 up on a light stand, pretty high up. And power wise, it was probably only on just above the minimum amount of light so not very much but i had it on about a 90 degree angle you won't be able to see the camera but the camera is over there behind there so it's a, probably about a 90 degree angle just lighting the tree and this grass on the ground just around it only from one side i only had one light on now this composition is absolutely fantastic i'm wrapped in this one now this is just set on a static tripod no movement no nothing now one thing you'll notice i had lens warmers on both of these cameras because it's quite cold out here it's actually turned really cold and there's frost all over the ground um, so i had the lens warmers going no problem with any of the images and i've learnt my lesson i mean it, 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 i should know better but you know these lenses when they're left out here for this amount of time they will fog up when this dew comes down it's quite calm there's no wind and uh, yeah really enjoyed this composition and I can't wait to see this one but let's go and have a look at the other one see how many shots we've got there and I'll hope it's gone from one side to the other let's go and have a look now you're probably wondering what this strange contraption is here well it's actually a light you can see it there it's a little light panel which I had shining up into this tree right here because I wanted to backlight it but it was too bright so I just put a towel over the top of it like that and that uh, lowered the intensity of that light just enough to make it uh, well hopefully work exactly the way that I wanted it to all right let's go and have a look at the rest of it well I just came across here and I was over the other side of the creek there and I, I heard this noise and I thought what's going on there's a possum sitting on my camera chewing the cable a possum 
anyway, he's gone up in the tree up there. I threw a stick at him. I didn't hit him because I do like animals. But anyway, here we are. So let's have a look. It's made it over to the other side. So it did the slide, which is the main consideration that I had. Now, what have we got going here? Oh, wow. 544 shots. So this one didn't take as many as the other one. Um, but the other one, by the way, I had set on an intervalometer. So I had it set to just keep going until I came back to stop it. This one had a set number of intervals and a set number of shots to take. And that was uh, designed into the app when I set it up to, to go. So basically it started here, about there, or probably about there, and moved all the way across to here. So it's about 24 inches roughly. Just moving across this scene here. Now it's only a fairly slight movement. Um, but I'm pretty happy with how it looks like it's worked fine. So this is the Nikon D750 with a 14 to 24 f2.8 lens. I've got it set at 14 millimeters, so it's really wide. And I've got the cable here, which I think hopefully still works after that possum, um, plugged into the motor drive. And this is, as I said earlier, a move, shoot, move device. So it just moves a little bit, shoots, moves again. And that's automa automated via the app. Now I'll show you the app and I'll show you how I set that up. This went for 200 minutes. Um, I had the shutter speed set at 15 seconds. The interval I had at 22 seconds. So that gives it about somewhere between a five and seven second interval between shots. The reason I set it for 22 is because I just wasn't comfortable the other night. I had a bit of a play with this had it set at five seconds uh, and it appeared to move before the exposure had finished. Uh, it, it looked okay, but I wasn't too sure about that anyway. Um, so what else have I done? I've set it at 25 frames per second and that gives me a calculation of 545 frames here. All right, so this is what the app looks like. Um, it, you basically set it so that you can create poses. So pose one and pose two. So pose one, is where the slider there is at the moment and you can see it there now if i happen to click on the pose two it will go over and you'll see the uh, slider move across to pose two okay so there it goes it's heading over to pose two because i just clicked it on the on the mobile app there you can see it going across so that enables you to set it up and to see what it's going to look like before you get out in the field which I think is a pretty good idea. Okay, so, and then we just tap time lapse and we go into those settings that I mentioned before. And there you can see the parameters that I set up that I mentioned to you just a minute ago. The record time and the interval time, etc. And from there, all you do is press start down the bottom here and away it goes. So one of the good things about this setup is that you can go away with the phone. The phone doesn't have to be here. I was way up the other end of the property, nowhere near Wi-Fi or Bluetooth range. Um, and it just keeps going because it remembers the settings that you put into it. So all in all, it seems to have worked quite well. You guys are going to see it before I do right here. But uh, yeah, and I made sure that my tripod was level. That's a really important step here because... Uh, the, there's a lot of weight on the end. This motor, once the motor and the camera are on one side of this tripod, there's an awful lot of weight. And I still am a little bit dodgy about that because this Nikon D750 with the 14 to 24 is a really heavy combination as opposed to um, this end, which doesn't have the motor hanging off. And I tend to be able to push it a bit further that way. Um, but anyway, it works quite well. You can see I've used a lens warmer here on the, the lens just to keep it from fogging up because I've learnt my lesson as I mentioned to you before. This is a little bit different design. Uh, I've got two different lens warmers. This one, let me just get it off and I'll show you. Okay, there it is. This is a, a Firefly, um, Kendrick Firefly. Really good, just a little bit of a Velcro on the end, connects into a battery. Now the only thing I don't like about this one is that it's got this crazy cable which um, I don't know why they put an RCA cable on a, on a device like this because that's an audio cable. So you've got to then create an adapter to make it work. But it does work quite well. And I plug it into one of these uh, jump starters for a car. 
and it works really well. Well, it appears to be flat now, <laughs> but it's been going all, all night. Uh, yeah, it works really well, and I'm quite happy with how that's going. Now, one of the main considerations with this particular shoot was that I wanted to make sure those logs in the water had a touch of light on them, but not too much. So I didn't want to directly light them with anything. So what I did, I grabbed this loom cube and um, I just put it onto its lowest setting with an orange gel. And I actually placed it in the grass here, just so that I got a little bit of bounce back from that into the water. And it's, it's like a secondhand light, so I can't dim it as much as I'd like to. Oh, well, I think you can with the app but I already had my phone going with the other thing. I hate using apps for lights and everything else. I'd much prefer buttons. Um, but anyway, it worked and um, I had it there and I just got this little touch of light here, which I thought worked pretty well. Then I had another light over there, which is the, the main light for the sort of side front view. And I'll just show you that one now. So here we have our main light and this is pretty much the same setup as what we had before. Uh, just a Z96 video light on a low level, basically lighting up the tree. You can see a tree there in the background, and also just a little bit of the creek, which was around uh, in the foreground here. I don't know if you can see that. Just, just the grass and the creek over there. So that's what this light was doing, and yeah, it did a pretty good job. I reckon I'm happy with that. These things keep going for hours, and that's the big advantage of them, because they're only on a very low level. Uh, so they don't need to be bright, they just need to have just enough light, because remember, I'm shooting this at ISO 3200, um, so yeah, it's, it's um, pretty high exposure, 15 second shutter speed, f2.8, doesn't need to be much light. Now as far as post-processing these images into a time lapse, there are a lot of options. I generally use Lightroom to edit all the images the same, unless it's a more complex sequence such as a day to night. Now, I'll still use Lightroom to edit these, but they require another plugin called Time Lapse Plus Studio to make sure the exposure blend is smooth. Now, I also use a brilliant piece of software called LR Time Lapse to render out the video files. You can also render time lapse video straight out of Lightroom using the slideshow module. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you the final sequences we've just shot using the techniques I've described to you today. I hope you like them. So I hope you enjoyed that. And as always, I'm just really so grateful to you for supporting my work here on the channel. And I really do value your comments and suggestions in the comment section down below. Don't forget the downloads linked underneath this video. And well, this week I can't actually upload any time-lapse images. It's just too large a file size to be manageable. So as a bonus, I'll upload a surprise image for you guys to play with this week. Anyway, I'll look forward to seeing you for another episode next time. I'll see you then.